Hello, good afternoon. Um, so today we're going to go on with um, uh, those central passages in Wittgenstein uh, about following a rule. And uh, then on Friday, we start in on um, Kripke's uh, account of rule following. Kripke is fairly sure that he has the whole thing sorted out. Um, so we'll look at Kripke's way of sorting everything out in the three lectures after this. Um, today, I want to really focus on um, uh, what the main problems are in understanding Wittgenstein's um, picture of what's going on in our understanding of language and the way language functions. Um, <clears throat> incidentally, on Friday, we will give out the topics for the next essay. Um, so there's that to look forward to. Um, uh, okay, I, I, so in the last two sections today, I want to focus on the main issues um, uh, uh, in understanding Wittgenstein's positive account. I want to begin by doing a kind of compare and contrast of Putnam and Wittgenstein, because there are a lot of similarities between the ways that the two of them set things up. Though there's somehow the whole how should I say, the whole vocabulary, the whole um, angle of approach looks so different. There are actually a lot of points of similarity. Um, I mean, here's Putnam, um, a famous remark Putnam made, cut the pie any way you like, he says in his Yankee way. Meanings just ain't in the head. Um, and um, Wittgenstein does not put it quite like that. Um, but the message is actually very similar, right? I mean, Wittgenstein is also agreeing that it's not the stuff running through your head that fixes the meaning of the sign. Um, and uh, if you think about translating Putnam's account into um, the way I've been explaining Wittgenstein's, you might think, look, how do you explain to someone the meaning of a word like water or gold, how do you do it? Well, the natural thing to do is show them some of it. Say, look, this is water. Here's some water. That's water. That's water. This isn't water. Um, you explain to them that w you, you give them examples of things that the word applies to. And after a bit, the pupil starts being able to apply the word to things too. And they rattle on in the same way. So what happened there? Very natural picture is that what happened is that the student got it, that's the kind of stuff and got a mental picture of what water is. That's what they're using to guide their use of the word. And um, Putnam's point in both, both when he's talking about twin earth and when he's talking about brains in a vat, is that this kind of image of water, this stuff running through your head, isn't, um, can't be what fixes the meaning. Because after all, on earth, and on twin earth, Oscar I and Oscar II can have exactly, they will have exactly the same image um, that they associate with the sign water. But the meanings of the signs they're using are quite different. They stand for different stuff. Or if you think about Putnam on brains in a vat, then um, Putnam's very explicit in that brains in a vat article. The image is running through your mind. The images running through uh, the mind of the brain in a vat can't fix the meaning of the sign. Um, so for Putnam, just as for Wittgenstein, this image in the mind just drops out. There's no such thing in an account of understanding and meaning. Um, and of course, there can't be, uh, I mean, it's obvious, I think, that uh, it can't all be dictionary definitions of the signs either, because dictionary definitions must come to an end somewhere. Some, somewhere there must be words that you understand without the use of an explicit verbal definition. So how is it that there's such a thing as going right or wrong in your use of the word water on Putnam's account? What does he have to say about this? Well. Um, Remember, his picture seems to be, his mature picture seems to be something like, is what substance it is that you're encountering, what substance it is that you're responsive to when you're using the word water. It's what is, um, w what the chemical structure is out there that you're causally responding to. 
as opposed to what Oscar II is causally responding to. The other element is um, that there can be experts, um, jewelers fixing the reference of the word diamond, for example, um, chemist fixing the reference of a word like silicon, um, experts out there that you defer to in fixing the reference of the word. Um, so this positive picture doesn't look much like Wittgenstein's. Um, I mean, the picture is there's this underlying structure out there. This, these things, the, the superficial characteristics of water or gold might generate a picture in your mind, but that is not what's fixing the reference. What's fixing the reference is the underlying structure that is causing your use of the word. So for Putnam as for Wittgenstein, it's right to think that you shouldn't look deep inside the mind for an account of the way language works. You have to look out to the context in which the language is being used. Um, but he doesn't have anything like Wittgenstein's notion of a custom or practice. Uh, and given that this notion of a custom or practice is difficult, and I'll go on in a bit to, to try and indicate what the difficulties are with it, um, you might say, well, Putnam's picture looks a lot better um, because at any rate, we know what that means. You're responding to this underlying structure. This looks like quite a clean, scientifically oriented account of what's happening in our understanding of language. We're causally responding to some aspects of the environment and not others. But can you do it all in terms of causation and what he called the division of linguistic labor, the way you rely on experts? Could you give a whole account of understanding and meaning in those terms? Uh, well, the thing about division of linguistic labor, the thing about relying on the experts who are going to tell you what's really meant by diamond or silicon or whatever, is that they can't be relying on further experts themselves, or even if they are, if they say there, is the, the, there are the hidden ones who really know the meanings of the words, that's got to come to an end somewhere. There have to be experts who are not relying on anybody else, and then the question is, how does that work? How does understanding and meaning work in the most basic cases? Um, and then all we've got left is the causal encounters with the things in the world around you. But then we run into those problems that we went over talking about the disjunction problem and talking about um, Dretschke. Um, how, uh, you, you know, you, uh, you remember, the, <laughs> remember our old friend, the magnetosome? You remember the magnetosome? Yeah, causally responding to um, this and that, or four are causally responding to horses and cows. Um, you can be causally responding to things, but getting it wrong in your use of a sign. So how can causal encounters be generating standards of right and wrong? Um, Dretschke's idea was, uh, well, maybe talking about water has a biological function, namely to indicate the presence of H2O. Um, and maybe that notion of function is uh, what um, is going to generate the standards of right and wrong for our uses of ordinary English. But uh, remember, this was a point about notions like being popular or um, uh, what were the other cases? Who's in control? How much control do I have over the ongoing situation? If you take words like popular, then maybe the biological function of a word like popular, the way most of us use it, is to make us feel good about ourselves. Maybe that's when it's really functioning optimally, when it's generating illusions about, uh, <laughs> I don't mean to be too depressing, but <laughs> about how well liked we all are, if you see what I mean. Yeah, so biolog biological optimality there really might not be the same thing as truth. There is just a basic problem for that talk about biological function. And if you say, well, okay, I'm not really talking about biological function here. I'm just, as with Fodor, going to talk about purely causal connections. Forget the stuff about function. It's just what makes me use the word. Then even if you have Fodor's thing about causal asymmetry, remember causal asymmetry? Um, 
you, you respond to horses. Uh, your use of the word horse is causally responsive to the presence of horses. Your use of the word horse is causally responsive to the presence of cows, but it's only causally responsive to the presence of cows because it's causally responsive to the presence of horses, and you're not very good at telling the difference. That, that was the kind of story. But the really basic problem there is you can't <coughs> see why that would be generating standards of right and wrong. Suppose you do stand in that causal relation to your environment. How does that make for such a thing as there being right and wrong? So although Putnam is like Wittgenstein in saying, well, forget about going inside the mind for an account of understanding and meaning. Look instead at elements of the context. What he's ultimately pointing to are aspects of your causal encounters with the things you're talking about. And it's hard to see how that generates standards of right and wrong. So in Wittgenstein, this notion of a custom or practice, whatever it means, that looks better equipped to explain how there are standards of right and wrong. But then the puzzle is, what exactly is a custom or practice? Um, how, and how is it generating standards of right and wrong. How does the existence of a customer practice explain how there can be such a thing as truth or falsity in your use of language? That's the basic puzzle about language use that we, we've been discussing really in one way or another all the way through. How does it help? He seems to think it's absolutely key. He seems to think that's what illuminates everything. It's some kind of feature of the context. It's not something deep in your head. But what exactly is it? What kind of feature of the context? OK. So much for Putnam and Dritschke and Fodor. OK. You all happy to wave goodbye to Putnam and Dritschke and Fodor at this point? OK, well, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> right. Onwards. Onwards? OK, onwards. Um, so what is a custom? What's he talking about? Here are some. Well, what I've done in the rest of uh, today's little chat is select what I think are some of the most intriguing comments he makes that bear on custom or practice. And I'll try and explain. What, something about what I think he's getting at, these ideas. But I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to give you, I don't have, frankly, a resolved account of what he means by customer practice. So if anything occurs to you in, uh, uh, as we work through these quotes, um, do let me know. Uh, and really, the, uh, I'm, I'm perfectly serious. You are just as likely as anybody else to come up with something on this. Um, OK, so here's one. Um, intriguing remark. If language is to be a means of communication, there must be agreement not only in definitions, but also, queer as this may sound, in judgments. Um, and I think what he means there is, um, if you, it, it's natural to suppose that, look, all we have to agree on is the definitions of the words. <coughs> So long as we all assign the same meanings to the words, what does it matter whether we agree about which things the words apply to? That doesn't matter so much. So long as we all give the same meaning to the word, you or I might disagree the whole time about which things are blue or which things are fair. Um, uh, aren't children like that? You know, children are always squabbling about what's fair and what isn't, right? You know, so maybe they never agree about, but so, uh, 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 about the application of the word to particular cases. But so long as they all agree on the definition of the word, that would be the key thing. But I think it's part of the picture that this notion of meaning as being given by a definition is just dropping out. We're, we're not to think in those terms of meaning as being given by definition. And Agreement in judgments is going to be essential for agreement in meaning. If there's going to be such a thing as communication, there has to be agreement 
in judgments. That's got something to do with the existence of customs or practices. Here's another remark. How am I... A Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that would uh, say that in, in a chair you would um, ex like exclude everything else that's not a chair from the definition of a chair and include everything in the that says chair when you would say chair like in my chair you include everything that's, that's a chair in the definition and exclude everything that's not which means that when you judge something to be a chair you would if you would correct me if you would read a definition yes Very good, yes. Okay, well, um, yeah, that, that, that's fair enough. Look, the, the, I think the simplest way to get your point is, is it, let, let me play this back to you, would be if you defined chair by giving a big list of all the chairs, yeah. right? You said, let's call that one X1, X2. I don't, I'm not pointing to the people here, I'm pointing to the chairs. X1, X2, right? And then you say, well, all the chairs are X1, X2, right? And then you give your big list. And um, then you give your big list of things that are not chairs, which will be a, a longer list, right? Um, uh, and uh, then you say, now you know what a chair is, right? It would be an untypical, uh-huh. <laughs> I don't yeah. think the definition is just a list. I think it's describing okay. a list in a way that makes the list correct. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, okay. But you, you, so the, way, the, the thing about doing it in terms of a list, right, is that you've given all the cases. You know, you have to agree in all the cases if you're going to agree in the list, sure. right? But suppose you don't do it by giving a list, right? What, what would you do? And what's the alternative? Giving it by a list will work, right? And sometimes you do define things by giving a list. I mean, that happens in legal definitions the whole time. By the party of part A, we shall mean Mrs. Henshaw or Mr. Bloggs, right? Um, uh, but um, if you don't do it by a list, what do you do? Describe it, yeah. You give a general rule, yeah. yeah. A genus and a differentia, very good. This speaks the voice of um, medieval scholarship, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that, that's right. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Very good. Okay, yeah, genus and differentia would be fine, yeah. So, yeah, a rational animal, uh, uh, something like that, yeah, yeah. That's okay, in a m medieval dictionary, but anyway. <laughs> but okay, fair enough. Yeah, that is fair enough. Um, okay, so you give a general criterion, right? And the thing is, if you're giving a general criterion for the word to apply to something, yeah, um, it doesn't matter whether you and I agree in any particular case. You and I might squabble the whole time about which things meet the definition rational animal. Couldn't that happen? Not if we agreed on what was like a rational, what was meant by rational animal. You say, I wouldn't call him rational. And I said, don't be silly, he's uh, perfectly rational. That could happen. We could agree on a definition. But we just don't agree on how it applies to cases. Think about children uh, arguing about what's fair, right? Yeah. They, 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 they say this is perfectly fair, and um, I, I say that's not fair. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, so we're just agreeing about the case, yeah. Um, uh, but we can't we nonetheless agree about the definition. You know, we both agree. Look, fair means everybody's treated the same. Okay. I mean, isn't that what happens in like a political argument that everybody agrees? Um, what, a f what fair means. It's just that they don't agree about whether this way of providing health care is fair or not. That makes every dispute into a dispute about meaning. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. That seems to get, that, that, that's going a bit far. You know, sometimes people are actually not disagreeing about meaning, yeah, but about the facts. Do you see what I mean? You're, you're generating a whole lot of probably support. So let me. <laughs> yeah. Of what he's saying. Yeah. I mean, you could then agree on a sentence as a proper definition of a word, but then if you're actually disagreeing on a particular instance of that, then maybe 
that sentence doesn't have the same meaning for you as it does them. Right. You're kind of going back to this point that you don't agree on the definition. Like you may agree on the token definition that this sentence mm -hmm. properly does, but has a different sense to you than it does to the other person, which kind of brings back to this point. Yeah, look, that can happen. You know, it can happen that there's a dispute and people are just disagreeing about the meaning of the word, right? Um, but it seems to me that's not usually what's going on in politics, uh, for, for example. I mean, if you say, um, what is the best way to generate wealth? Right? Is it to have a strong public sector or is it to keep the public sector as weak as possible? People disagree about that kind of thing the whole time. <coughs> yeah? Are they just having a verbal dispute? Do they just disagreeing about the meanings of the word, best way to generate wealth. I mean, it seems like a really substantive dispute that, you know, people really, people spend their lives uh, uh, trying to prove their opponents wrong in this kind of thing. If it was all just a verbal dispute, why would you bother? I mean, look, if you and I are having a <laughs> if you and I are having a fight and I say, look, I'm better than you, and you say, no, that's where you're making a mistake, I'm better than you, right? Um, we're having a disagreement there, right? We might actually fight about it. It's not that we're just disagreeing about the meanings of the words better than you. Just to give <laughs> I don't mean to sound aggressive here. <laughs> 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 Anyway, sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, well, it seems like these, these guys are talking about definitions, and then you're turning it into meaning. And I don't think it's clear that those two things are the same thing. In fact, I think we can look at the way we actually use words and the way people, the, the kinds of definitions we hold in our mm -hmm. minds. <laughs> That's the average Aristotelian, but anyway. <laughs> but my point is that a biologist, yeah. for their purposes and their context of knowledge, they're going to need a much more pointed, specific definition in order to tell them what's essential to their purposes for using this concept of human being. They're going to need something in terms of the biological story. I don't, I don't know, whatever it is that separates us biologically. Yes, right, right, animals. right. But, so we're going to have two different definitions, but it's clear that when I say human being, I mean the same kinds of things right. that the biologist means, yeah. even though we have different yeah. So it seems yeah. like what we do need to agree on is judgment, and we need to agree that we're judging yeah. these things to be the same kinds of things, but it's, it's not clear that we need to agree on the definition. Uh, yeah, I, uh, very good. Uh, um, I, uh, there's a really interesting point there, and then something that's a bit more contentious, I think. Uh, the really interesting point is that very often when you're defining a word, um, you can be quite sure that you understand what human means. Right? Well, I, you know, most of us would say, look, I, I know perfectly well what the word means, but give a definition. I'm not sure I know the right definition. I mean, get, you, you, your, your knowledge of meaning seems to be more basic than your knowledge of a definition. Yeah, that, that's part of what you're saying. And I think that's true and really interesting, actually. You know, if you think about, um, uh, you, you know, m m most kind of basic notions, like chair, for example. How do you define chair? Well, it's got four legs. Of course, some of them don't have legs at all. Um, you, you see what I mean? You could, you, you, you could start out giving a definition and then just not be quite sure if you're hitting it off exactly. So there is some sense in which, this is a pro, well, this is a pro Wittgensteinian remark, that knowledge of meaning seems to be more basic the knowledge of definitions. Right? The, the other part of what you say is, therefore, it's um, agreement and judgments is the basic thing. The, that's a separate point, and it's not quite so obvious where the agreement and judgment comes in then. Yeah? But it's certainly an interesting and important point that your knowledge of a definition is often less certain than your knowledge of the meaning. You see what I mean? I mean I, I, it's not a trivial thing to give a definition of a word. Is this I don't know if I'd say that it's less certain, though. I guess I think what I'm saying is that what the appropriate definition is depends on what, what other words or concepts you're trying to relate it to in your Yes, right, right, right. Yeah, there's, there's room for choice there. 
Yeah, but what you think the right family of concepts is to be defining it in terms of? Yeah. Um, I, I start to think of more, more persuasive examples um, where we really might. I, 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 I mean, suppose you and I are detectives investigating a murder. You know, that happens, right? Um, and you say, well, I think Smith did it. And I say, no, no, it was Jones. That can't be just a di disagreement about the meanings of the words. OK, I get that. OK, right, bingo, OK. <laughs> I thought that's a better example right, than these political cases. Yeah. There, there are certainly lots of cases where people disagree about what happened in the past. Yeah. Um, and they're not just disagreeing in the meaning. The whole point is they agree about the meanings of the words but not in the examples. Yeah. And then you would think, when you think of that kind of case, look, you give the, the way it works is you give the general rule for the use of the word. And then whether or not you agree in the cases, a further question. Yeah. And I think what's plausible about what you say, the reason it's engaging wh wh what you say is, if you really agreed in the definitions, why would you be disagreeing about simple cases when it's kind of obvious what went on? OK, there I'm pushing you too far. OK. <laughs> yeah. If we agree, I think part of what you're saying is, if we really did agree in the definitions, why would we disagreeing in very obvious cases when the thing is right in front of our noses? Yeah, um, and, and that is plausible. But the point there is still, it's a f you would you would naturally think it's a further step, whether we agree in the cases, even if it's a kind of obvious step. Yeah. The, the agreement in the meaning in the one thing is one thing, and the agreement in the cases is another. Yeah. But what he's saying here is more radical. He's saying, throw away this idea of the meaning of the word in general. Throw away this idea of the definition. Um, all there is is the agreement in judgments. And th that's my read of what's going on here, anyhow. He's saying, just forget the stuff about definitions. Um, Here's another case that I think is making a similar point. Um, he asks, how am I able to obey a rule? How is it that when you're using a word, there is such a thing as you obeying a rule? How, could, how can you be obeying a rule when you use a word? If this isn't a question about causes, about what it is in your brain that's making you do this, then it is about the justification for my following the rule in the way I do. What gives me the right to use the word the way I do? And you know, so suppose you're asked, um, how come you're saying this is red, or how come you're saying this is fair? Um, then you can give some kind of justification. But at the end of the day, um, if, I, if I'm just saying to you, look, this screen's white, um, and you say, how come you're saying it's white? What gives you the right to do that? Um, then I might do a bit of talking. But at the end of the day, um, I can't really explain it any further. I don't have any justification to give. I can't say I've got some definition of white in my head, and this, this screen matches the definition. Um, I reach bedrock, and my spade is turned. And then I'm inclined to say, this is simply what I do. I just call that white. You want a justification? get lost. This is what I do. There is no d a definition in my head, no knowledge of meaning in my head that is giving me the right to use the word this way. I just do it, and that's fine. <laughs> you got a problem with that? <laughs> you see what I mean? You can't give justifications for your basic uses of words. A definition in your head it sounds like that would give you a justification because you say, no, no, look, it matches the, the definition. But that's not, what, that's not the way it's working here. You're just doing it. You just are using the word. When I obey a rule, I don't choose. I don't look at the definition and say, does this meet the def criteria? I obey the rule blindly. I just say what I do with my eyes shut. There is nothing for me to consult, nothing for me to check. I just talk the way I do blindly. And 
And then there are these passages we glimpsed last time, um, where he, he talks about whether you could be doing this on your own. Is it is what we call obeying a rule, doing this thing blindly, simply doing it? Is that something you could do just once? You just apply the word um, uh, white just once, and only once, and you're the only one that ever does it. I take it the answer there is kind of obviously not, he's thinking. If you're, if you, if you're operating with a picture of a definition or some instructions for how to use the word, then you could do it once and once only. But part of the point of talking about a customer institution is to say you couldn't be doing it just once. It's not possible there should have been only one occasion on which someone obeyed a rule. It's not possible there should have been only one occasion on which a report was made, an order given, or understood. And hence, hence, or since it's not an interpretation, obeying a rule is a practice. And it's critical to this that even although you say, this is simply what I do, you use the word blindly, when I say that's white or that's not white, I can be getting it right or wrong. I can think I'm using the word right, but be making a mistake. I can be making a sincere, an honest mistake in my use of a word. But how can that be? How can you be making an honest mistake in your use of the word if this is simply what you do and you do the thing blindly? So there's no justification, nothing that you're appealing to to justify your use of the word. You are just doing it, but nonetheless, there are standards of right and wrong here. And you can be being perfectly honest and trying hard to get it right, but you're just not getting it right. How did that happen? It's not like you're violating the rule book. There is no rule book. Um, I say since that's right, since thinking that you're obeying the rule is not the same thing as obeying the rule, it can't be that you can do this privately. If you, if you were trying to do this on your own, outside a social context, I think this is what he means, outside a social context, then um, when I was saying this is white or this is not white, um, me thinking I was getting it right would be just the same thing as me getting it right. The, the, exi the, the possibility of an honest mistake only comes up because there are other people around who can say, no, this is where you're going wrong. If other people couldn't correct my use of a word, there would be no such thing as getting it right or wrong in my use of the word. You might think, look, I'm going to use the language the way I do. You use the language the way you do. In principle, we could each do this individually on our own. Right? I mean, it's much handier if we all agree to use words in the same way. You see what I mean? I mean, just, just for getting on and getting instructions and getting help and so on. It's very helpful if we all use words in the same way. But really, we could all just fragment. The idea of the Tower of Babel, where everybody speaks a different language, that makes perfect sense. Right? He's saying that's not true. If everybody spoke their own language, there would be no such thing as truth or falsity in what you said. It's only because there is a, um, a context of people um, all speaking the same language, that there can be such a thing as right or wrong. It's not possible to obey a rule privately. Otherwise, um, thinking you were obeying the rule would be the same thing as obeying it. You, you see what I think he's saying there, anyhow? I mean, you don't have to agree either with whether it's true or with, with whether I'm reading him right, but do you see what I'm, what I'm saying he's saying? Okay. Okay. But what is it for there to be a custom? It can't be just that there are lots of cases in which the word is applied. I mean, how could that help? Just so I mean, how does having lots of people applying the word help? I mean, just when we were talking about the ca causal asymmetry theories, you say, yeah, okay, I see what a causal asymmetry is, but how does that mean? There are standards of right and wrong. Here you could say, okay, I get it that when you're um, 
using a word. There's no rule book you're trying to keep stick to the rules of. Um, I'm just doing it. I'm doing it blindly. Um, but how does the existence of a whole bunch of people just doing it or doing it blindly, how does that help? How does that mean that there's right and wrong here? Um, there's got to be something about, I think, if, if we're uh, understanding what he says, it's something about, he's got this idea of a form of life, um, something about the way we find it natural to use the word the way we do, or what Cavell called the whirl of organism. And I think that's the bit that has to be added. This is my reading, anyway, that has to be added to this thing about many people. There must be many people around. And so the final thing I want to do is look at this idea of a form of life. <coughs> okay, as a way of explaining what a custom is. Can I go back one? Yeah. So the question is, what is a custom in the use of the word? We know in Putnam's picture what the context is that gives the word meaning. Now we've got to know what kind of context that has to be there for Wittgenstein to give a word meaning. Um, so, OK, the, the, we, <laughs> he's saying, to find the standards of right and wrong, you don't look inside the mind of the individual. You've got to look outside of the customer practice. And then he says, well, what's a custom? Well, to obey a rule to make a report, to give an order, to play a game <coughs> of chess. These are, and I think what he's saying is these are essentially customs, uses, or institutions. And if you're going to understand a sentence, you have to understand a whole language. And understanding a language means to be master of a technique. And I think by technique, he means here something like using a tool, like using a chisel, or using a saw, that you, you, being able to use a hammer and chisel is not a matter of having a rule book in your head. You, it, it doesn't really matter whether you have some definitions or rules in your head as to how the chisel should be used. It's just the way you do the thing, the way you attack the wood with the um, hammer and chisel that is being master of the technique. And similarly, with using a word, it's like using a chisel or using a saw. It doesn't really matter what rules you have in your head. It's whether you um, do the thing skillfully. Um, and what about th th this case um, really arrests me whenever I read it. So here's what I make of this. He says, it is, of course, imaginable that two people belonging to a tribe unacquainted with games should sit at a chessboard and go through the moves of a game of chess, and even with all the appropriate mental accompaniments. So they have all the right thing. You know, you, you know you're playing chess, you think, oh my god, or I can't remember how this moves, or um, um, uh, hooray, I've got him, uh, all, 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 all that you, know, you know all that stuff that goes through you. So they have all that stuff going through their head. And if we were to come upon them, so we come upon them in, let us suppose, a clearing in the jungle, these people who belong to a tribe where there are no games. Right? They, they, they just don't do games. Right? So there is no custom or practice or institution of game playing with these people. Um, but still, you come upon um, two individuals sitting at a chessboard, going through all the moves of a game of chess, and even with all the appropriate mental accompaniments. And there you might say, um, but look, they're playing chess. Playing chess doesn't require an institution or custom or context. People could just do it in this way that is kind of out of the blue. It just comes from nowhere. And similarly, you might think, look, someone could just come from nowhere and be talking English. They don't need to belong to a community where there's a custom or practice. You don't need that kind of context. Someone could just land out of the blue. and you, you know, you might come upon someone on the moon who's never been near the earth, never been near any, any, any other sentient being, but still they're talking English. And he says, look, what he's saying about this is, if you were to see it, you would naturally say, this is what's going on. They're talking English or they're playing chess. But he says, look, now imagine, imagine that what happens is this. Suppose that a game of chess was translated 
into a series of actions that you don't ordinarily associate with a game, say into yells and stamping of feet. So suppose you came upon two individuals um, doing a, exchanging a series of yells and foot stamps in such a way that you could translate this back into a game of chess. And you say, wow, look at that. Isn't that amazing? They're playing chess. They're doing it with this thing with the yelling and the stamping of the feet. Um, I got the translation here. Isn't that strange? They belong to a people who have no games. They don't have any customer practice here, but I've got a way of translating these yells and stamping of feet back into a chess game. Suppose these two people to yell and stamp instead of playing the form of chess that we're used to, and this in such a way that their procedure is translatable by suitable rules into a game of chess. Well, it is, should we still be inclined to say they were playing a game? Well, what right would you have to say so? It would be really arbitrary to say, well, I can make this translation, therefore they're playing chess. And you could say the same thing about someone who you think might be speaking English. Suppose it's just yells and stamping of feet in such a way that you can translate it into English. And you say, well, look, he's, um, you know, you come upon someone in the moon who you can translate to English like that. And you say, look, he's speaking English. The mere fact that you can do this translation doesn't mean that they're really speaking English or that they're really playing chess. <coughs> so that's one of the things about a custom or practice, that it's not enough that you find someone doing something in such a way that you could translate it into English, even if it looks just like English, so the translation is just identity. If you see what I mean between their signs and, and the ones we use. Um, it, there has to be some background of custom or institution um, in wh of which their um, actions are a part there has to be some sense in which your actions are a part of a broader institution. You have to belong to a people that really does play games. You have to belong to a people that really does speak English. And your use has to be embedded in that broader practice or customer institution for there really to be such a thing as getting it right or wrong, playing according to the rules, or not playing according to the rules. Um, and, here's, and then you say, but now, what is it? for a people to have a practice is not anything that goes through their heads. It's not something about their um, use of mental dictionaries or something. Everything about what makes a people have a language or not is open to view. There's nothing hidden here. So what is it? What's the difference between people who are using a language and people who are just doing some arbitrary yelling or stamping of feet? How would you draw that distinction? I mean, suppose you come upon an animal species like dolphins, and you say, look, they emit all these bleeps. I can translate this into American English. Therefore, they're speaking American English. Well, when do you have a custom or practice here and when not? And he gives this example. He says, suppose someone uses a line as a rule in the following way, and it's something like this. You've got a line here, and you've got a pair of compasses. You, you know what it means? You got a pair of compasses, um, you know the thing you use for drawing circles? Um, do people still do that? Uh, maybe you guys all just do use a computer. Um, but you know, in the old days, we used to, <laughs> we used to we, uh, in the old days, we used to have this primitive device for drawing compasses, for drawing circles, I mean, that um, you got a spiky bit and you got a, a pen bit. You, 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 you know what I mean? You stick the spiky bit in, in the, yeah? <laughs> and, and you can vary how, how big the circle is by varying the, yeah, it's hard to remember, but yeah, you, you, you could vet. OK, so he's got this, so and he's got a line here, and he says, look, the line is my rule, right? And what he does is he holds a pair of compasses, and he carries one of its points along the line, and he says, this is the rule. And the other one is drawing the line that follows the rule, OK? And while he moves along the ruling line, he alters the opening of the compass apparently with great precision, looking at the line the whole way. So he keeps looking back at the line, and the compass is moving in and out. And so he goes right. Okay, And you're getting a line something like that. 
And he keeps doing the thing with great precision, looking at the rule the whole time, as if it determined what he did. And watching him, we see no kind of regularity in this opening and shutting of the compasses. Um, we um, uh, and he says, says now, you see how, now you see how it works. Now you can do it. On you go. And you say, I have no idea how that works. Right? Now it's not that he has a definition in his head that you don't. That's not the key thing. It's just here he's going on in a certain way from case to case. Um, but you can't learn his way of following the line from it. Now, he might be perfectly serious. Uh, and you say, look, the original seems to intimate to him which way he is to go. But that's not a rule. This line here doesn't count as a rule. Okay, now, the, ho the kind of homework question here is, why isn't it a rule? I think he says very clear about that. This is not a rule, but why not? He's using that. He says, look, I'm using this to guide me along here. You can't learn from his way of following the line how to go on. But why isn't it a rule? Any offers? Yeah. Right. But in what sense isn't there a socially accepted custom? Yep. There's no goal? Yeah. But th 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 that sounds like appealing to a definition, though. You see what I mean? I mean, you're right that um, there isn't a goal, but I think. That's what we're trying to explain, if you see what I mean. The, 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 you know, if you get that, you're home. Sure, if there isn't a goal. But the question is, he's going to say, yeah, my goal is to get it right. You see what I mean? Right. Right. That's not his take, right? The idea is that there isn't that kind of verbally formulable rule. Yeah. I mean, with chess, the idea is at bottom, you can try and formulate the rules of chess, and you actually might get it right or wrong. People could play chess, like children playing hide and seek. Yeah? Hide and seek? OK, <laughs> right. You can play hide and seek even though you've never written down the rules. Right? I mean, children regularly do that. You just kind of, it's perfectly obvious how you play hide and seek, right? What, what, what you're doing. Um, and the idea is it's like that. So if someone writes down the rules for hide and seek, that's not trivial. You really might get it wrong when you try and explicitly write down the rules. You might miss out some obvious thing. Yeah? I mean, something that's obvious when you're playing the game. Um, so, yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell you what my. Although I'm not confident about this, I'll just tell you my own stab at this, is that um, it's because we can't learn from him that there is no rule here. That's, uh, the thing is, that's all it comes to. There are some ways people go on, and you can kind of pick it up and go on in the same way yourself. There are some ways people go on, and you can't pick it up. You can't get it. And that's the whole difference. That's what I, the, the, uh, so th that's what it takes for there to be a custom. It's for there to be a way of going on here so that other people can pick it up. And that's not because there is some definition or rule that you have in your mind. It's just like hide and seek. There's some way of picking this up. You know, people find it natural to do this. Yeah. So it's not exactly just that. Um, there are many people involved. It's that they can pick it up from each other without that involving explicitly forming a rule or having something running through your head. You can just, there's some more primitive phenomenon of getting it. Okay, more on this on Friday. Thanks. <laughs>